Muy buenos días a todos, sean cordialmente bienvenidos nuevamente aquí en reuniones clínicas de la Facultad de Medicina de la Universidad Pontificia Bolivariana. Me presento, mi nombre es Keinin Esperusa Álvarez, la comunicadora de la Escuela de Ciencias de la Salud y el día de hoy la doctora Claudia Villegas no nos, no nos puede acompañar, pero le manda un cordial saludo a todos los presentes aquí en esta reunión el día de hoy. Eh, también les queremos agradecer por su asistencia y por estar conectados con nosotros a esta hora y de igual manera le damos la bienvenida a todos nuestros expositores Isabel Rueda Aguilar, Ana Sofía Ortega González, Santiago Giraldo Rodas, Amalia Medina Martínez, Sebastián Muñoz Cañola, Nicolás Cabrera Arbeláez, Acheli Santa María, María Clara Torres Ferrer y Andrés Bejarano Agudelo en compañía de los docentes, la doctora Elcio Laya Estefan y el doctor Jorge Ignacio Celis Mejía. Bienvenidos a todo nuestro grupo el día de hoy. Bueno, entonces me voy a presentar y les eh, digo que nosotros vamos a estar hablando en inglés, entonces let's turn the switch to English. So, good morning to everyone. I hope everyone is well. I'd like to first thank everyone for being here with us uh, this morning and welcome everyone to our clinical medical ground round of traumatic brain injury or TBI for short. This RSM will be in English and then everyone, if anyone has any questions, in the end, it is highly recommended to ask them in English and if, if anyone has any difficulties and, you know, to ask in English, you have all the liberty to ask in Spanish and we'll, of course, uh, answer in Spanish. Uh, I'd like to present our speakers today. We'll cons uh, consist of second semester, Ana Sofia Ortega Gonzalez, Isabel Rueda Aguilar, Santiago Gira uh, Giraldo Rodas, and third semester, Amalia Medina Martinez, Sebastián Muñoz Cañola, Jo Nicolás Cabrera Arbeláez, and from fourth semester, Ashley Marie, Santa Maria, Maria Clara Torres Ferrer, and Andres Bejarano Agudelo. And fourth semester will be open up this case, So I would like to give the welcoming, welcoming to uh, Ashley Santa Maria, which she will be um, opening up this clinical case. So Ashley, you have the spotlight. Thank you. So we're going to start with the case report. A 20-year-old unhelmeted in prone position white male was found by bystanders unconscious at the site of a motorcycle accident. We had lost control and went off the road. He was brought to the emergency department via ambulance intubated as a level one trauma activation. So next up is case details. First up is physical examination, the Glasgow Comma Scale. It's a point-based system that evaluates the consciousness of a patient. There's three categories, eye opening response, verbal response, and motor response. This patient had a scale of four, which is severe because eight or lower means severe. So the patient for eye opening response did not respond to any simulation of the doctor, so he got a one. The same as a verbal response. In motor response, he had abnormal extension, so two. The vital signs, he was brought bradycardiac, 28 beats per minute, and hypertensive. He had an initial blood pressure of 172 over 105 millimeters of mercury. Next, we have head and neck. He had a four millimeter bilateral fixed pupils and a right cerebral spinal fluid artery up. This is important because depending on how severe the trauma to his brain was, this can, for example, cause an alteration to his optic nerve. So what's a CT scan? It's a computerized tomography that combines a series of X-ray images. It shows difference in densities. For example, on the image below, we could see that hypodense is, for example, water. Hypodense would be black, and hyperdense is white, so it could be blood or calcium. In the next slide, we can see the difference in a normal CT scan versus what our patient had. So in the middle picture, we could see that, for example, the first circle is the cellular turca, and normally it's uh, white. But, no, normally it's hypodense, so black, But in, for example, here it's white hyperdense because it's filled with blood. So what is TBI? It's traumatic brain injury. 
So it's damage to the brain from a violent blow to the head from an object that goes through the brain tissue, disrupting its normal brain function. So for we have primary injury. So it's from traumatic events and it could cause intracranial hematomas, skull fractures or contusions. Something secondary is due to the damages of the primary damage. So metabolic and physiological changes like hypoxia, hypotension, ischemia, and cerebral edema. And lastly, the epidemiology. So in the US, 1.5 million cases are recorded per year. The leading cause of death under in people under 45 years old is TBI. These injuries result in 500,000 deaths, 800,000 to 900,000 cases of debilitating head injuries. And in Colombia, the main cause of death is violence. 49% to 70% of these cases correspond to TBI. So train, traumatic brain injury is a global problem since 69 million individuals worldwide are estimated to sustain a TBI each year. So next up is anatomy and histology of the brain in Santiago Giraldo will be talking. So, so it is said that if a, to a person to have a trauma like the one presented in the clinical case, it helps to fall over 294 times in a year to make one of those falls develop this kind of trauma. In order to understand this, it is important to know the anatomy of the brain. And to know the anatomy of the brain, it is important to see a little bit of its development since we were born. So in those times, most of our cranial bones were not joined with each other. That particular characteristic allows us to identify fontanions. There is a membranous space in the human skull that later will become intersections. So the first fontanion we have is the dorsal, it's in the dorsal parts of the head, and it's the minor fontanion. Now, in the upper part, part of the head, we have the major fontanion. And on the lateral sides of our hands, we have two more fontanions the sphenoidal fontanel and the mastoid fontanel. We expect that all of these fontanels close and make intersections with their respective bones in the first two to three years of living. Now that we have an idea of how our neurocranium grows and joins, Isabel Rueda is going to start talking about the normal adult anatomy of the head, understanding where the anatomical accidents came from. So the cranium is constituted by multiple bones that of course articulate themselves by a mobile joint originating the structure that we know as a cranium. What is the principal function is to protect the brain. And of course, let some senses and the apertures of the digestive and respiratory system develop. And of course, when we develop, we can divide it like into sets. First, we have the visor cranium that is known as the face of the skeleton, and we have paired bones and unpaired bones. The paired bones are nasal concha, nasal bone, maxillar, protein bone, lacrimal bone, sigmatic bone. And the unpaired ones are mandible and bulbar. And then we have the near cranium that has a spinal function to protect the brain. It, the bones that compose this set are base, front, occipital, temporal, ethmoid, sphenoid, and parietal, and most of them are paired. Then we must talk about some characteristics. First, the bones of the cranial bulbs are cancellous, that means that they are deployed. So if they have like small holes where some veins can go through. Then we have the bones of the cranial base present air sinuses that allows the cranium to be lightweight despite it has like multiple bones. Then we have, we must talk about um, some reverse points that are lambda, the first one, that is located at the intersection of the lamboid and sagittal saturn. They are between, it is between the occipital and bone of the parietal bones. 
Then we have Bregma that is located at the intersection of the coronal and sagittal Saturn on the pyramidal portion, frontal and parietal poles meet at this point. We have like the most important one or the most known that is Therion or also known as spinofrontal Saturn that is located on the lateral aspect and is formed by the junction of the parietal, this one is part of the tympera, front and the greater wing of the spinal form. Why is it important? Because it lies over the anterior division of the middle meningeal artery. It's super thin at this point, so a fracture can easily happen and is very likely to happen. What happens if it fractures? Can disrupt the middle meningeal artery. And why is it super important? This artery, this artery, sorry, is because it irrigates the meninges. How it enters to the brain or how it supplies the meninges is because it enters into the middle cranial fossa through the spinous foramen. And if it's disrupted, can cause a epidural hematoma. And last but not least, we have the asterion that is located on the lateral aspect formed by the junction of the occipital, temporal, and parietal. Then we're going to talk about the codes of the endothelium that are in the meninges. So the endothelium uh, is coded by first the duramater, that is a meningeal sheet made of fiber tissue that is divided into the pure steel part, that is the part that sticks to the bone, and the meningeal, that its principal function is to protect the central nervous system. Both of the sheets are not stuck with each other, so allows to create the venous synthesis where the blood that fluctuates through bones and brain drains. Then we have the subdural space that allows this light and movement between the arachnoid and the middle. Third, we have the arachnoid that with a special treatment can contribute to reducing physical, physio, physio, physiological intracranial pressure. Fourth, we have this arachnoid space that is the most important or relevant to this particular uh, case. So what happens there is that the cerebral spinal fluid flows and in this fluid, like the brain floats and serves as a buffer. So in case of an injury, it doesn't directly affect the brain. It also, it has, well, like the main components of these are trabeculae that allow the adherence to the via mater, mater, has of course arachnoid granulations where the CSF is reabsorbed and it has main structures like the principal arm. Superior cerebral blood vein, great cerebral vein, and superior anastomic vein. And the fifth and the last one is the pyramidal. It's fenestrated, is the one that is closest to the brain. And what means that is that is fenestrated? It means that it has folds that allow the cerebral spinal fluid, like to have contact directly with the brain. But um, we have to answer like what, why it's important to know the meningeal sheets on the TBI is because the open TBI lacerates meningeal sheets, but closed TBI doesn't. Then it helps me to know which structures are compromised, especially in this case, in the subarachnoid space ones. Now we have Sophia Ortega going to present you hematomas. So according to layers and spaces of inner cranium, uh, we are going to mention three of the principal accidents that we present in the clinical case. So the first one is the epidural hematoma that is um, a bleeding, a, a bleeding sorry, uh, that occurs between the other member covering the brain, that is the dura mater and the uh, skull. 
Second one is the subdural hematoma. That is a type of bleeding in which a collection of blood uh, gathers between the inner layer of the dura mater and the arachnoid mater, that is the most important of the meninges that surround the brain. It usually results, the results from tears in bringing veins that cross the subdural space. Usually this hematoma is relationated with a traumatic brain injury, but not always. And then we have a subarachnoid hemorrhage that is a bleeding between the, ar the arachnoid membrane and the pia matter surrounding the brain. The arachnoid hemorrhage most often occurs as the result of a significant head trauma and is usually seen of the sitting of skull fractures or injuries of the brain itself. And now we're going to introduce again to Santiago Rodas that is going to present the cortex. Talking a little bit about the cortex of our brain, it is made up of brain matter, the stomas of the neurons, which we divide by zones such as the lobes. In this slide, you can see colored in different colors the different lobes. So let's begin. In red, we have the frontal lobe. In a general way, it has motor functions, and its prefrontal portion has executive functions. This means that it helps in troubleshooting process, control of attitudes, personality, thinking, and a lot of more of uh, more of things that help us to be us. Now, in blue, we have the parietal lobe. Broadly speaking, its functionality focuses on sensitivity, touch, pain, pressure, temperature. Just think about sensitivity. Now, the yellow one is the parietal lobe. Its general functions, functions are hearing and memory. In the posterior pole of the brain, in green, we color it the occipital lobe, whose function is vision. We can see colors and objects thanks to the occipital lobe. Those are the lobes that almost all the people know from childhood through basic education, but there are two more to mention. By opening the silvio sulcus, which divides the temporal lobe from the parietal and from the frontal lobe, we can bite inside the insular lobe, which is involved in perception of pain in terms of simplifying it. Next slide, please. The last lobe is located in the mesial phase of the brain, the limbic lobe. It's in charge, broadly speaking, of emotions, vegetative regulation, motivations, and smell, learning, and some types of memory. But just think about emotions. Each of these lobes is made up of different areas, but in this talk, we only want to mention two that are very, very important. The first one is Broca's area in the frontal lobe that allows us to emit a response in a conversation. In the second one we want to mention is the Wernix area in the parietal lobe. And it's a little bit of the, of the temporal lobe. The Wernix area allows us to understand language. Now that we have a little bit of knowledge of the cortex, we're going to talk about the ventricles and cerebrospinal fluid. So Anas Ortega is in charge of this. So talking about ventricles and cerebrospinal fluid, we have that the lateral ventricles are C-shaped. They reflect an association with the developing of telencephalon as it swept upward, back, and then down and forward as a temporal lobe. And cerebrospinal fluid flows through the interventricular foramen of Monroe into the narrow third ventricle. Then it passes to the cerebral aqueduct and finally to the fourth ventricle. The escape sites. Uh, where CV CSF can flow into expanded regions um, in the sort of subarachnoid space are the cisterns that are in the medial foramen of Mijendi and in, in the lateral foramen of Flushko. The choroid plexus extending into the ventricles are the ones that produce a cerebrospinal fluid. So now we can say that rostrally in the narrow cerebral aqueduct leads into the four ventricle. Caudally, the foramen of Magendi is the one that provides the escape of CSF into a cistern of the subarachnoid space. The dorsal surface of the brain stem is on the floor of the four ventricle. The cerebral peduncles from the lateral boundaries and in the medullary pelvis that is of the cerebellum in the roof of the four ventricle. 
talking about the circulation of this cerebrospinal fluid, we can say that flows internally through the ventricles, from the lateral ventricles, then into the third ventricle, and finally to the cerebral aqueduct to pass to the fourth ventricle. This is, the CSF flows from the fourth ventricle into the cisterns of the subarachnoid space, as, as I mentioned, uh, surrounding the brain and the spinal cord. It provides a, an external protective, like of cushioning or buoyancy uh, to, the nervo to the central nervous system for minor traumas. As Isabel said, it basically, basically the brain floats into the cerebrospinal fluid. Next slide, please. Uh, talking about the histology of the brain, we can say that it's formed by a gray matter that is made up of cell bodies and dendrites. And on this side, and on one side, we have the white matter that is made up of axons and myelin. So uh, in the picture, you can, see, you can see that the cortex has six layers of different types of cells, fevers, and many things. The first one is the plexiform layer that we have neuroglial cells. The neuroglial cells can be astrocytes, microglial cells, ependymal cells, oligodendrocytes, etc. And these ones are in control of the metabolic support of the neurons. Ependymal cells um, have phagocytotic properties to help the neuroimmune reactions that happens in the central nervous system. And also, uh, re uh, it helps to the production and the management of the myelin. Then we have another layers. There are the small and medium pyramidal cells, the granular layer, the large pyramidal cells, and finally, the layer of polymorphic of fusiform cells. In the next slide, we can uh, see the histology of the cranium. So we want to propose a, a question that is, why is the skull stronger than the other bones of the body? So we can say that the neurocranium suitors are fibrous joints that connect the bones, closing that fontanelles that we mentioned in the beginning of the meeting. And throughout the years, the suitors can lose like their initial position, like they move. So they do an ossification and we can conclude that that in the adulthood, the cranium is constituted by only one big bone and is the product of this ossification. Now we are going to pass to third semester with Sebastián Muñoz. Okay, good morning, everyone. First of all, I'll talk about the intracranial pressure. This is the pressure exerted by fluids such as cerebrospinal fluid inside the skull and on the brain tissue. ECP is measured in millimeters of mercury and at rest in its normal uh, 7 to 15 milli millimeters of mercury for a uh, supine adult. And finally, this ECP is ruled by the Monroe Kelly doctrine. The incidence of an increase in ECP is found in 50 to 60 of patients with severe TBI. For now, the Monroe Kelly doctrine established that the intracranial volume, which is the sum of the brain, the cerebrospinal fluid, and the blood, is constant. An increase of on in one of uh, these compartments is compensated by a decrease in the number of another to maintain a constant uh, ECP. When a mass is introduced, in this case a bruise, into the cranial ball, the CSF and venous blood move to make room for the mass with a relatively normal ECP. However, in the, if the mass is large enough to overcome this mechanism, the ICP increases exponentially. This model is useful to for understanding the increase for ICP after a TBI, as the secondary lesion evolves with an increase in cerebral edema, ICP increases and results in brain compression. And for last, the clinic with which 
patients can enter the emergency room after a TBI can be very varied, all depending on the level of severity and how it has evolved as the time passed between the first care and the time of arrival. One of the first things that can be found is bradycardia and hypertension, where the second of them is a compensation for the first one. With this in mind, we can say that it is one of the most alarming signs indicating that the intracranial pressure is so high that the brain mass already tends to move towards the largest hole that we that the cranial ball has, the foramen magnum. Uh, and this is what we call uh, brain herniation. As a result of this displacement, uh, the hernia is creating a compression in the spinal ball, which is responsible for the vasomotor, respiratory, and cardiac function of humans. This state of shock of the patient has to be resolved immediately, and one of the easiest ways to do it is by injecting hypertonic solutions. This, with a mechanism of redistribution of liquid or water proper uh, from the CSF and the brain. As final result, the fluid is distributed in another way so that intranial, intracranial pressure is relieved and the patient's state of shock is reduced, improving bradycardia and hypertension. Well, that's all for me. Uh, my next partner is Amalia. Okay, so we have the cerebral perfusion pressure, and I'm going to start talking about the cerebral metabolism. So, as we know, the brain normally consumes 20% of the total body oxygen. Most of the cerebral oxygen consumption is used to generate ATP, which is important um, because of the support of the neuronal electrical activity. It is important to mention that the cerebral metabolic rate is usually expressed in terms of oxygen consumption and its values average between 50 to 65 milliliters minute in adults. We have that the cerebral blood flow, which is the blood volume that flows in unit mass per unit time in brain tissue, and it is typically expressed in units of milliliters blood, and it can vary with metabolic activity. The cerebral blood flow has a value between 750 to 900 milliliters minute, which is going to be the equivalent of 50 to 20% of the cardiac output. So, as I mentioned, it can vary with metabolic activity, being some of these factors the concentrations of CO2, hydrogen ions, and the concentrations of oxygen. So, we have that CO2 and hydrogen increase the cerebral blood flow because we have that the neurons work and they are going to produce from oxygen CO2 which is going to go into the blood and become carbonic acid inside of the red blood cells. This carbonic acid is going to dissociate and become bicarbonate and hydrogen ions. When this increase is when vasodilation has to occur to increase the blood flow. On the other hand, Lactic acid, pyruvic acid, and other elements on, of tissue metabolism also increase the concentrations of hydrogens in blood. The effects of the hydrogens um, are that when we have a high concentrations of these, it's going to reduce the activity of the neurons because, we, as we know, the neurons are the responsible for carrying information throughout our bodies using electrical and chemical signals. These are important because, well, they help us coordinate all of our functions. For them to carry out all of these functions, well, neurons have to work using oxygen, which will increase the metabolism, again, produce CO2 and carbonic acid and hydrogens. This will increase the blood flow, but it will decrease the neuronal activity. So to regulate the blood flow, we have a sort of mechanism in which it will sweep away the CO2 and the other metabolites so that the normal values of hydrogens will be regulated again and the neurons will start working. We have that the O2 consumption by the brain is 3.5 milliliters of oxygen per 100 gra grams of brain tissue per minute. So our brain does not allow itself to not have oxygen, so its partial pressure of oxygen ranges from 35 to 45 millimeters mercury, 
When this partial pressure of oxygen drops to more or less 30 millimeters mercury, vasodilation is generated so that more blood arrives and therefore we can obtain the oxygen that the brain needs to continue functioning. The cerebral perfusion pressure is the difference between the mean arterial pressure and the intracranial pressure. So cerebral, cerebral autoregulation adjusts uh, cerebral blood flow in response to changes in the mean arterial pressure. Decreases in the cerebral uh, perfusion pressure will result, will result in cerebral vasodilation, whereas if we have elevations, it will induce vasoconstriction. In normal individuals, the cerebral blood flow will remain nearly uh, constant in between the le the levels of the mean arterial pressure that is about 60 to 160 millimeters mercury. Within the, these ranges, the cerebral blood flow will always be the same. Outside of these, um, the blood flow will become pressure dependent. So pressures above 150 to 160 millimeters mercury can disrupt the blood brain barrier and may result in cerebral edema and hemorrhage. Hypertensive people as a defense mechanism, adapt to their high pressures and can tolerate up to 160 to 180 millimeters mercury with anything happening in the blood flow. And it is also important to mention that the blood flow becomes more pressure dependent at low arterial pressure in return for the cerebral protection and also at higher arterial pressures. Now, uh, Nicolas Cabrera is going to be talking about the ischemic injuries. Thank you very much, Amalia. So now we'll be talking about a little bit about ischemia. What is ischemia? This is the question. It is a disruption of cerebral blood flow, or in short, CPF, that can create an oxygen deficit, deficit in the brain parenchyma and result in significant subsequent, uh, subsequent uh, sorry, uh, hypoxic injury with cell death. This is a secondary injury that can occur along a spectrum of severity but is typically more pronounced with severe TBI and associated with poor outcomes. An ischemic injury occurs at any point during the uh, acute phase after a TBI and is due to changes in the intracranial pressure, or ICP for short, that disrupts the cerebral blood flow and tissue perfusion. This can be caused directly by intracranial injury or as a consequence of a general hypotensive event in a medically un unstable patient. Ischemia triggers multiple cellular responses, including depolarization of the neuronal cell membrane and cellular swelling. There is oxidative damage, which um, damages lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids by reactive oxygen species. And finally, there's an activation of inflammatory pathways, which in the next slide we'll talk a little bit more about. So first, I want to talk about the effects of ischemia and regulation of uh, cerebral blood flow. The cerebral blood flow is constant and the constant is between 70 and 100 uh, milli milli millimeters per mercury. And if you have a lower PPC, it could come down below 60. And when it increases, you'll be talking about a little bit higher than 130, 140. And if you go to the point where it is 150 millimeters per mercury, the vessels rupture and it penetrates the BBB. What is the BBB? The blood brain barrier and therefore produces a subarachnoid hematoma. And then therefore, it, an ischemia produces because of swelling. But the three actors that we should take in much consideration is the brain volume, which um, occupies 80%, the cerebral blood flow, which is 10%, and the cerebral, blind, uh, cerebral spinal fluid, which is another 10%. And if there's an increase in any of those three actors, uh, there will be an ischemia, which is a secondary edema and causes uh, an increase in intracranial pressure. So in this graph, it shows there are several pathways that contribute to exos, exos, uh, exocytotoxic neural injury, I'm sorry, in ischemia, which there is an excess of cytosolic calcium playing a participating role. There are glutamate receptors that enter the membrane, and also there, uh, these receptors would be the GLU-R, the AMPA. Also, what we were talking about in the first slide about the uh, inflammatory pathways, those are caused mainly by the COX receptors. So finally, in the reperfusion injury, 
which is a restoration of the cerebral blind, uh, blood flow, may also lead to a cerebral or perfusion injury, which carries the risk of cerebral edema and intracranial bleeding, and which can result in damage to tissue, which is not injured, which is not injured in the initial assault, which is the primary injury. Perfusion injury is a complex process that can occur in different organs, but primarily we're talking about in the brain. As is the case with ischemia, it plays a significant role in reperfusion injury, with damage occurring at the cellular and molecular level that ultimately activates the apoptosis, uh, apoptotic pathways, which is cell death, uh, suicidal cell death. Uh, the tissue injury is also thought to be partly uh, mediated through activation of the immune system, which is the complement system, and platelets and coagulation cascade components really fit in, in that system. Controlling the CDF is understood to be a critical step in minimizing uh, secondary ischemic and reperfusion injuries. Therefore, ICP, which is intracranial pressure monitoring and therapeutic interventions, is aimed at aiming at ICP and severe TBI and has been a cornerstone in acute T uh, TBI care. So now, my colleague Maria Clara will be talking about uh, the part of semiology and the care. Okay, so it's important to keep in mind that with Nico, next slide. It's important to keep in mind that with the patient that has undergone a traumatic brain injury, the evaluation and stabilization of these patients usually begins at the site of the accident, and it's usually done by paramedics. And the measures that should be taken include managing the patient's airway, with the proper cervical protection, providing fluid re resuscitation if necessary, identifying and stabilizing any extracranial injuries, obtaining reliable information on the mechanism of injury, and of course, the rapid and safe transfer to a hospital that's capable of providing adequate medical and surgical resolution. Next slide. So there are five prognostic factors that according to the Brain Trauma Foundation are the strongest predictors of future brain damage from the time of injury until the patient is resuscitated. And these factors include the age of the patient, the C2 results, the pupillary reactivity, the Glasgow score of the patient, and the presence or absence of arterial hypotension. This last factor, the presence or absence of arterial hypotension is especially important because it's the only factor that depends on early medical action. So it's the only one that can really be altered or modified by um, adequate and early medical intervention. And it's also really important because hypotension after a severe traumatic brain injury contributes to an increase in secondary brain damage. So it's very important um, to keep the, the blood pressure under control. Next slide. So every patient who arrives at an emergency department with a head injury must be assessed by a qualified member of the staff, which is usually a doctor or a paramedic in less than 15 minutes. So time is of the essence with these types of patients. It's important to mention, um, we already mentioned the Glasgow Comma Scale before, but it's important to mention that there will be cases in which the Glasgow Scale cannot be evaluated or its use will be limited. So some examples of this are if the patient has, like for example, an eyelid edema, which would make it difficult, of course, to evaluate the eye opening category, or a patient that has aphasia, which would make it virtually impossible to evaluate the verbal response category. We also have patients in their pre-verbal years, but for that, we do have the pediatric Glasgow Comma Scale. Um, and if you can see here on the image on the right, on the category of 0 to 23 months, instead of uh, verbal response, we use smiles or coos, cries, or screams. Next slide. So the patient's TBI, according to the Glasgow Comma Scale score, will be classified as either mild, moderate, or severe. And if you recall, the patient of the clinical case that we've been speaking about on his initial evaluation, he had a Glasgow Comma Scale of four. So that patient's traumatic brain injury would have been classified as severe. 
Next slide. So there is another scoring system that has been becoming more widely used called the FOUR score, which stands for Full Outline of Unresponsiveness Score. And it's a 17 point scale with potential scores ranging from zero to 16. And the lower the score, the wor or the worsening level of consciousness. And the four score is similar to the Glasgow comma scale score in that it also evaluates eye response and motor response, but it, it's different in that it does not evaluate verbal response. And instead it evaluates brain reflexes and respiration. So it has several advantages over the Glasgow comma scale. And one important advantage is that since it does not evaluate verbal response, it can be used to adequately evaluate uh, patients with endotracheal tubes, patients that are intubated. Next slide. OK, so. Regarding the symptomatology, it varies widely depending on the severity of the traumatic brain injury. So patients with mild traumatic brain injury usually will become alert and attentive within minutes, and they may have symptoms such as headache, dizziness, faintness, nausea, maybe a single episode of emesis, difficulty with concentration, brief amnestic period, or slight blurring of vision. And in children, the symptomatology might be more of drowsiness, vomiting, irritability and vasovagal syncope. And with mild traumatic brain injury, there are um, post-concussive states. So the patient um, may develop a post-concussive concussive state that consists of fatigue, dizziness, headache, and difficulty in concentration, but it should resolve within a few weeks of injury. And just a small percentage of patients may develop post-concussive disorder, which is characterized by neurologic, cognitive, and behavioral or somatic complaints that will continue beyond the acute and subacute periods. So usually beyond three months, and these patients will usually need medical treatment um, to take care of their symptomatology. Next slide. With traumatic brain injuries of intermediate severity, we will usually see patients who are not fully alert or have persistent confusion, behavioral changes, extreme dizziness, or focal neurologic signs, just hemiparesis. And these patients should be admitted to the hospital and undergo cerebral imaging studies. And usually we will see with these images that a hematoma will usually be found. Patients with severe in injury will usually show up unconscious and they might um, show either de decorticate or decerebrate de posture. Decorticate posture is when the person is stiff with the arms bent, and you can see this on figure A in the image below. Their fists are clenched and their legs are held out straight. Their arms are bent in toward the body and the wrists and fingers are bent and held to the chest. Figure B shows a decerebrate posture, which is um, entails a poor prognosis, and it involves arms and legs being held straight out, the toes being pointed downward, and the head and neck being arched backwards. The muscles are tightened and held rigidly. And now my colleague Andres de Jarano is going to talk about the patient's treatment. OK, thank you, Maria. Eh, OK, we're go now going to talk about the patient's treatment and we're going to eh, emphasize a little bit in the medication and the procedures that were done to the patient eh, previously. And then we're going to explain day by day the evolution of the patient with the corresponding eh, CT scans. So first of all, we're going to talk about the medication and treatment. The patient received sodium nitroprusside. Uh, which is a medication used to lower blood pressure and decrease the bleeding. In this case, it's intracranial pressure due to cerebral edema and herniation. Uh, the arterial line, uh, where, well, there were also an arterial line, a central venous catheter, and an extraventricular drain, which were done to lower the amount of fluids and to drain all the amount of liquids uh, to decrease intracranial pressure. Uh, 
Also for the herniation syndrome, the patient was given a uh, 30 grams of IV mannitol, uh, which was used, with, which is a diuretic used to decrease ICP, also by eliminating fluid, and also a hypertonic solution of 23% sodium chloride, which was done to do the same thing, to eliminate fluid. Uh, and in addition, a left-sided decompressive craniectomy, which is a surgery uh, that removes a portion of the, sc of the skull when the brain swells uh, following an injury. That's also to reduce intracranial pressure and was a procedure done. And lastly, we had an al also uh, um, something that was given to the patient. It's amantadine, which is uh, an antiviral for influenza virus type A in the post-intubation pro procedure in order to prevent infection. Uh, next slide, please. Now we're going to talk about the patient evolution uh, during the hospital days. Uh, something that I want to clarify is that when I'm talking to the Glasgow comma scale and I have the uh, suffix T, it's, it's a Glasgow comma scale of an intubated patient, uh, which is uh, from uh, 10 to 2 and, and it does not evaluate the verbal response due to the intubation so that in order to keep in mind that so first of all the patient on hospital day two had an icp elevation with shivering hypertension and fever which were controlled with increased sedation sodium nitroprusside as, as it was said before and a targeted temperature management respectively for each variable and on hospital day three he had an improvement uh, of the glasgow comma scale from 60 to 80 and with intact brain brainstem reflexes but on hospital day five, the Glasgow comma scale decreased from 80 to 3T with a elevated ICP, markedly elevated, of 46 mercury millimeters. In addition, he had cerebral edema, subfalsing herniation, and a subarachnoid hemorrhage, as it is going to be shown later on. So what was given to the patient? It was given uh, to him, uh, as it was said before, uh, uh, an ACL 23% uh, solution, a sodium chloride uh, intravenous in order for it to remove fluids. And also on hospital day eight, uh, the Glasgow comma scale uh, increased a little bit, but there was also a uh, made the craniectomy as it was explained, explained before, and the extraventricular drain to lower the fluid. Uh, on hospital day 14, uh, the Glasgow comma scale um, increased from 10T, the patient was more stable, he got a uh, he stopped intubation and he began with amantadine to prevent infection. Uh, later on, on hospital day 15, the improvement of diffuse cerebral edema, it, it, well, it improved. And uh, also with the effacement of basal cisterns, as it was going, as it is going to explain later on, on the CT scans. And finally, on hospital day uh, 21, uh, the patient had an unchanged neurological status. Uh, he had a, so he moved to a, Uh, now we're going to explain with the CT images what happened to him. Uh, next slide, please. So first of all, as I was going to explain, uh, in the first complications of the patient, we can see on the first CT on the left that he had both subdural hematomas, one left frontal and the other one parietal, as it is seen on the red arrows. And he had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is seen with the little uh, radiodense white spaces on the CT with uh, a subfalsine herniation, which is the most uh, threatening thing, life-threatening thing for the patient, as it was explained before, uh, because as you can see on the yellow arrow, uh, the left uh, hemisphere is deviated a little bit to the right midline in a, at a distance of 5.38 millimeters, which is something that needs to be corrected in order uh, for it to prevent further complications. Uh, okay, on, on the figure, no, uh, previous, I was going to, uh, thank you. On the figure on the right, we see that the head after the, after the craniectomy, because we can see here that there was a portion of the skull that was removed, and this uh, increased, well, this uh, decreased, sorry, decreased the intracranial pressure and improved uh, the symptoms of the patient. Now, yes, the next slide. In this figure, we can see the ventriculostomy on the right ventricle. Uh, we see the catheter, that white point that was done to the patient in order to drain the liquid uh, from, from its ventricles and the subarachnoid space. Uh, next slide. 
And here, as it was said on the final days of the patient, we can see that uh, now the, cr the craniectomy, craniectomy made an external herniation, but the intracranial pressure lowered. And we can see that in these findings, uh, the, the effacement or the, the, the third ventricle is not erased and it can be seen clearly on the image. So it's a symptom of improvement because we have a more clear CT scan with the ventricles and there is not there are not signs of subarachnoid hemorrhage anymore. And next slide. So uh, now we have to make the discussion. So uh, what it was concluded is that first of all, something very important that we need to know is that when we have a patient with a TBI, we need to predict the mortality with the lab exam imaging findings as we did. And there are also some calculators called crash or impact that are done to prevent the mortality of the patient. I have an example of it uh, in this image, uh, which it evaluates variables such as the motor score, pupils, hypoxia, hypotension, if there's uh, the CT classification, if there's a subarachnoid hemorrhage, an epidural mass, glucose, hemoglobin, etc. as it is seen on the image. Uh, it is done uh, with adult patients with head injury with a Glasgow coma scale with 12 or less. And this patient, according to the calculation, had a 14-day mortality risk of 91.8% and a 95.7% chance of unfavorable outcome at six months. It, this was a very bad uh, prognosis, but uh, even though the patient was managed in a very good way, in a very efficient way, and according to that, he had a favorable recovery, despite all that uh, complications. Uh, at a year of discharge, he was able to live at home, interact, go shopping, walk, feed himself, and perform simple chores, which makes us conclude that a TBI is something very variable between patients and needs to be managed by individually. Okay, next slide. And finally, the conclusions uh, are related to what I said before, is that the treatment of TBI is complex and needs to evolve with evidence-based medicine, which is more cases, research, and more investigations that make us clarify a little bit the treatment that needs to be done to these type of patients. Uh, decisions, we need to be very careful of making decisions with these patients because are, these are very critical and, and the making of these decisions are have a direct impact on the improvement of the patient. And the improvement, as it is said before, is additive of multiple interventions. So more studies, more studies need to be done to answer all of this. Uh, okay. Thank you very much. Uh, we hope you like this medical ground round, and we hope it was very useful for all of you. Thank you very much. And I'd like to say something real quick. Um, at the end of this, I want to say a big, big thank you to El Dr. Uh, Jorge Ignacio Celis Mejia that he has helped us throughout this whole RSM. And we would like to also thank for his time and his dedication and also his sweat and tears that he actually you know, helped us and he um, met with us every night to practice and gave us all the information and all the meetings. I would like to give a big thanks to el Dr. Celis, que en verdad nos ayudó durante todo este proceso y en verdad, muchas gracias, doctor. Bueno, muchas gracias a todos los expositores, excelente presentación. De igual manera, muchas gracias a la doctora Elcio Olaya y al doctor Ignaz, eh, Jorge Ignacio Celis. Eh, ahorita mismo nos, puede, eh, nos podemos disponer a realizar todas las preguntas pertinentes o comentarios a alguno de los asistentes de la reunión. No sé si quiere hacer alguna pregunta, puede activar su micrófono y realizarla. Heini, yo quiero... Yo quiero... Eh, felicitar a los estudiantes por este esfuerzo tan grande. En estos RCM que presentan los estudiantes, pues hemos intentado vincularlos y hacer revisiones de tema, basarnos en un caso clínico y que se desarrolle eh, una visión que viene desde lo morfológico, lo funcional, lo fisiopatológico, semiológico y en muchas ocasiones tocamos también lo farmacológico. Este ha sido un esfuerzo grande, es el primer RCM de estudiantes que se presenta en inglés, es un esfuerzo grande, el apoyo del doctor Jorge Celis fue fundamental, eh, orientó todo el seminario y yo personalmente le quiero agradecer toda su participación.
de la misma manera invitar a los estudiantes a que se vinculen a esta actividad. Es una actividad muy importante, muy constructiva para ustedes. La preparación de un tema, eh, como lo hacemos aquí para presentarlo, obviamente les exige, pero también les da una serie de, de, de ganancias, de aprendizajes que hay que tratar de aprovechar. Eh, también quisiéramos invitar a los profesores, muy importante que los profesores se vinculen con esta actividad, principalmente los profesores de básicas y obviamente los profesores de clínicas, pero quisiéramos invitar a toda la comunidad para que asista. Este es un espacio que nos hemos ganado poco a poco con los estudiantes, porque el RCM siempre se hace, pero que nos den un espacio y que tengamos además tiempo extra, tenemos media hora más. El RCM de los estudiantes empieza a las seis y media, concluye a las ocho. Hoy, se nos, hoy, se nos, hoy nos rindió el tiempo, pero yo quiero que vincularlos a ustedes y, y entusiasmarlos para que, para que eh, eh, ingresen a este, a este mundo del, 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 de la exposición, de, de la presentación, de, de tratar de profundizar en un tema, cualquiera que sea que les guste a ustedes. Eh, quisiera también, de pronto, si el doctor Jorge Celis todavía nos acompaña, eh, invitarlo a que nos cuente cómo fue esta preparación con estos muchachos y que también entusiasme a los, entusiasme a los, a los estudiantes y a los profesores a que se vinculen. Doctor Celis, ¿quiere usted hablar y contarnos cómo fue su experiencia con estos muchachos? Eh, buenos días, ¿me escuchan? Sí, perfecto. Ok, eh, primero que todo quiero eh, felicitar a los estudiantes por la revisión que se hizo y por el trabajo que hicieron durante todo el tiempo del acompañamiento. Eh, pues esto comenzó algún día en la clase de fisiología que se me acercó el estudiante Nicolás Cabrera a decirme que él quería presentar un RCM en inglés y que lo quería hacer sobre eh, trauma encéfalo craneano. Entonces yo le dije que con mucho gusto le podía colaborar. Él me pasó un caso, ese caso lo empezamos a revisar, y eh, resulta que mmm, cuando uno está de estudiante, uno siempre tiene sus... Eh, eh, su idea de que tiene que transmitir toda la información, toda la otra cosa, 100%. Entonces, en esto, ¿qué hicimos? Hicimos el caso, pero el caso, le dije, este caso lo tenemos que adaptar a, a nuestro sistema colombiano, entonces modificamos algunas de las medicaciones que teníamos allí. Eh, en el caso original usan... Eh, nicardipina para el manejo de la presión nosotros no tenemos nicardipina en nuestro sistema de salud pero sí tenemos nitroprusiato y el otro sería un beta bloqueador pero no podemos poner un beta bloqueador porque este paciente está con una, con una bradicardia entonces en el contexto de este caso no iba a ser la posibilidad entonces hicimos un, una adaptación del caso a nuestro país y empezamos a trabajar con ello hicimos varias jornadas de fines de semana donde discutíamos y eh, dentro de esto, para enseñarles a ellos a hacer presentaciones y cuando hagan presentaciones, cuando ellos me presentaron, si ustedes se dieron cuenta, en la, casi en la totalidad de las diapositivas está la fuente de dónde sale la información. Entonces yo les dije a ellos, uno tiene que acostumbrarse a poner de dónde sale la información en una diapositiva, porque uno no se inventó la información, sino que eso tiene un soporte bibliográfico y, y hay alguien en el auditorio que le gusta, entonces puede tomar la bibliografía, uno le toma la foto y va y busca el artículo. Entonces ellos lo hicieron muy bien y tuvimos diferentes reuniones. Y la última reunión la tuvimos el martes. Y en el martes, pues, eh, como yo les decía, que uno siempre quiere decir todas las cosas, yo les dije que había que ser un poco más concisos eh, y dejar unos puntos en el auditorio claves. Eh, fueron supremamente concisos que nos, nos economizamos casi media hora de lo que estaba presupuestado dentro del RCM, pero estuvo bien. Solo quiero hacer una aclaración en algo que se comentó. La amantadina es un antiviral, pero no se usa como antiviral. La amantadina eh, para todos sirvió menos como antiviral. 
La mantadina la utilizamos actualmente en los pacientes con trastornos extrapiramidales como Parkinson, temblor y otros, porque modula los receptores de glutamato y ayuda al temblor. Y una acción secundaria importante que se ha encontrado es que la amantadina en infusión puede ayudar al despertar de los pacientes. Nosotros en nuestro país tuvimos amantadina en infusión hace unos años y la usábamos en el paciente en coma. Lastimosamente la amantadina la retiraron del mercado los laboratorios y ya no disponemos de la amantadina en infusión. Entonces en este paciente, en el contexto... Eh, no lo usan como un antiviral porque no se usa como un antiviral, sino más como una, eh, un medicamento para incrementar los sistemas de alerta. Yo quisiera invitar a todos los estudiantes a hacer esta reunión. Me dio mucho pesar porque esta reunión pensé que ya estaba en forma presencial en la facultad, como ya, como ya estamos haciendo casi todas las otras reuniones en las instituciones que estamos con nuestra reunión máxima, hasta la reunión madre de cada institución, el RCM, nuestra clínica es hoy jueves, casualmente también tenemos nuestro RCM. Y estos son espacios que para la gente cuando estén en clínicas si y vayan al New England Journal of Medicine, hay unas revisiones clínico-patológicas y unas revisiones que salen allá y es lo que se hace en el Massachusetts General Hospital con Harvard Medical School entonces, en el, en el New England Journal of Medicine está la conferencia clínico-patológica, que es el, el, el caso clínico de la semana, que, fue una, que es una discusión, y que nosotros estamos también en mora de volver a retomar los casos clínico-patológicos. Yo no sé si en la facultad se está haciendo ese caso clínico-patológico. Y este RCM, que es una revisión del caso, que son los review articles que saca el New England, y se invitan a un profesor, internacional, entonces va al más general y hace una revisión y sale. Y de ahí sale una revisión escrita, publicada en el Journal of Medicine. Estos RCMs y estas cosas, yo motivaría a que los estudiantes hicieran una revisión narrativa, no copia, un copy-paste, sino una con asociados a un profesor, y se puede publicar en la revista de nuestra facultad, para que la revista de la facultad empiece a tener una esquina que se llamen los, las presentaciones de los RCM y de los casos clínicos que tenemos allí. Entonces sería una invitación que yo haría a la revista, a los estudiantes, a los profesores y nuevamente, doctora Elsi, quisiera a felicitar a los estudiantes por su compromiso, por su responsabilidad. And I'm so happy that they have been working hard and they did the best and uh, you had a very, very, very excellent clinical, clinical review. Thank you. Gracias, doctor. Bueno, si alguien quiere hacer algún comentario adicional, yo creo que esta presentación eh, abre expectativas y lo que decía el doctor Celi son espacios que nos hemos ganado, hay que tratar de conservarlos. Eh, bienvenidos los que se quieran vincular a esto con ideas nuevas, así como Nicolás la propuso, que la hiciéramos en inglés, de manera que adelante jóvenes, este es un espacio nuestro y tenemos que aprovecharlo al máximo. Eh, la idea del doctor Celis la hemos venido trabajando eh, de ser posible eh, que de esto quede fuera de la grabación, que siempre quedan las grabaciones para que las podamos utilizar en caso de que las necesitemos. Eh, hacer eh, de esto eh, una fuente de información cuando se hace una buena revisión de un tema, hacer una, tener una fuente de información que puede estar publicada en la revista de la facultad, como lo dice Jorge. Me parece que es, un, que es una idea interesante que podemos madurar e, e intentar que de todo esto quede, queden testimonios, que valga la pena el esfuerzo y que queden testimonios de lo que hemos venido haciendo. Yo creo que si alguien tiene alguna inquietud, alguna sugerencia, alguna pregunta, este es el momento de hacerlo. Aquí en el chat hay varios comentarios de felicitaciones para los muchachos. Eh, voy a leer algunos cuantos. Laura Martínez Fernández, qué te son muchachos, felicitaciones. Andrés Felipe Morales, cinco estrellas, excelente charla. Dal Daniela Perdono, excelente presentación, muchachos, mil gracias. Y todos los comentarios son de felicitaciones, muchachos, excelente presentación. Y como lo acaba de decir la doctora Elsie, 
cualquier pregunta, estamos abiertos. Bueno, no hay manitos levantadas, no hay más preguntas. Entonces, de nuevo, muchísimas gracias. Cerremos esta sesión. Yo quisiera, Invitar. antes de que nos vamos, a agradecerle a la doctora Elsie, porque la doctora Elsie creó esta reunión hace varios años y ella fue la, la creadora de este, de este espacio bajo la decanatura de la doctora Mónica Uribe. Llegó un día, yo estaba en una reunión y ella llegó con la idea y doctora Elsie, su paso por la facultad es una cosa que es una experiencia eh, de la cual todos hemos aprendido, sus discípulos, sus alumnos, su, usted ha sido una mentora de nosotros como docentes y eh, queremos agradecerle, yo quisiera aprovechar este espacio, lastimosamente no estamos en presencia, pero la doctora Elsi es una profesora que nos ha inculcado, a los que fuimos sus monitores, los que hemos sido los docentes, nos ha enseseñado a, a echar para adelante, a, a, a ser fuertes y una persona de mucho equilibrio mental, es una persona muy cerebral, con un humor que nos enseña todos los días a seguir adelante, doctora. Muchas gracias por estas grandes ideas y por ser partícipe de la vida académica de la facultad. Gracias, doctor. Usted me avergüenza con tanto comentario bonito. Bueno, muchas gracias y muchas gracias a los muchachos por estar aquí. Bueno, y antes bueno, de cerrar... Antes de cerrar la sesión, aquí hay un comentario de la doctora Claudia Villegas que nos acompaña desde la distancia. Me disculpo por no haberlos acompañado, me encuentro en un evento académico en este momento por los comentarios veo que estuvo excelente. Espero poder ver la grabación. Muchas felicitaciones a los expositores. Muchas gracias doctora Claudia por acá extrañándola, pero muchas gracias por la compañía a distancia. Y bueno, eh, muchas gracias a todos por acompañarnos, a los expositores, vuelvo y repito, estuvieron excelentes. Les recordamos que estas reuniones clínicas se hacen todos los jueves, eh, casi siempre a las 7 de la mañana. Y también nos invitamos a que estén pendientes a las redes sociales de la Escuela de Ciencias de la Salud, que por ahí se publican los enlaces para entrar a la reunión todos los jueves. No sé si quieran, eh, tengan algo más por decir. No siendo más, feliz sí. resto de día. Sí.